It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Robert L. Summel, Chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. Chairman Summelt began his tenure as a board member in August of 2006. On August 10th, 2017, he was sworn in as the 14th chairman of the NTSB. In 2019, he was reappointed as chairman. He's a fierce advocate for improving safety in all modes of transportation, including teen driver safety, impaired driving, distractions in transportation, and several aviation and rail safety initiatives. Before his time at the agency, Chairman Summel was an airline pilot for 32 years and had logged over 14,000 flight hours. Following his airline career, he managed the corporate flight department for a Fortune 500 energy company. He chaired the Airline Pilots Association's Human Factors and Training Group and co-founded the association's Critical Incident Response Program. He also spent eight years as a consultant to NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System. He has co-authored a book on aircraft accidents and has published more than 100 articles on transportation safety and aircraft accident investigation. And Chairman Summel earned an undergraduate degree from the University of South Carolina and a Master of Aeronautical Science with distinction from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He's also an inductee into the South Carolina Aviation Hall of Fame. Please join me in welcoming Chairman Summel. We hope you enjoy and learn from this session. Thank you so much. Chairman Summelt, uh, on behalf of AIN, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's 9 a.m. in D.C. Uh, and 9 p.m. here in Hong Kong. Uh, I've not been back in D.C. since I last interned. Uh, you're, you're exactly a week, I guess, from uh, your retirement from the agency. How are you doing and how are things going for you so far? Anthony, thank you so much for having me. I've been an AIN reader for a long time, going back to the days when it was aviation convention news. So uh, um, I appreciate very much your taking the time to interview me. Uh, things are going well. I'm very busy uh, between about three different things, uh, trying to close out uh, the performance evaluations for my direct reports, um, getting the office packed up, and finally, getting ready for a board meeting that we will have uh, on Tuesday, the 29th. So uh, uh, mm. pretty busy around here. I left the office about, about 1030 last night. Oh, wow. And I, I understand uh, you uh, commute back and forth as well. Um, has that move been been going going smoothly for you? Yeah, my home is in South Carolina. I've commuted back and forth for the last 15 years and uh about three weeks ago, I packed up the apartment and got everything home. Now the problem is trying to figure out where to put put all of that <laughs> stuff, plus blend yeah. in the things uh, that I've uh, accumulated here uh, in the office uh, over the past 15 years. Right. But uh, it's, it's right. pretty busy. But um, in fact, it's very busy just trying to get ready to uh, to leave. Yes, sure. I recall we've done a couple of webinars uh, in, in the last year with you, and I, I, I recall seeing all sorts of models behind you. Uh, now I see still the, the plaques are there. Um, some of the awards are there. Uh, looking amazing. Yeah, I had about 30 airplanes that I, uh, you know, beautiful model airplanes that uh, that were in my apartment and, and in the right. office. And when I got them home, I laid them all out on the kitchen island. And my wife said, I don't know what you think you're going to do with those. You need to pack those up and send them back to Washington and donate them to the NTSB. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> I just ran into a U-Haul and drove them home for 10 hours. So you want me to take them back now? <laughs> <laughs> right. Chairman, um, I guess what, what I would love to do um, with you today is to really take us back 15 years, you know, really reflect back um, over the last decade and a half uh, of your time here with the, with the NTSB. And, and perhaps we can start with... Um, Taking me back and, 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 and letting us know how, how you realized uh, when air safety was going to be your mission and, and your lifelong pursuit. What I can say is that I, I, when I was 17, I stumbled across an, an aircraft accident site. Uh, it was a King Air that uh, unfortunately claimed the lives of two people. And I, I thought a whole lot about that, about that crash. I uh, continued to... Uh, uh, fly during those days. Uh, would go uh, uh, once I got into college. Uh, 
six months, eight months later, I started going to the government documents library, reading NTSB action reports. And I knew, I knew way back then in college that I, I would one day want to be an NTSB board member. So, yeah, that's. Wow. This, this dates back to when you were in college. Uh, and, and, and you started flying, I recall, uh, in, or you were interested in flying as early as high school. That's exactly that right? right. I did start flying when I was in high school. And, uh, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been a great ride. I can't believe I'm on the other side of all of this, starting when I was about 17 and now just about hit, hit the six, age 65 and wrap up uh, 15 years at the board. It's been an amazing ride. Chairman, what, what sort of expectations did you have when you first joined the NTSB um, as a board member? Uh, and looking back 15 years, were those expectations more or less the same or were they different? Well, Anthony, that's a great question. I think I pretty much knew how the board operated. I had, uh, back in the early 90s, I had written an article about an NTSB board member and learned a lot about the board there. I went to the two two-week aircraft accident investigation school. I, uh, I had also participated in a few NTSB accident investigations through their party system. So I felt like I pretty well knew uh, how the agency operated. So uh, I'm sure I had uh, wonderful expectations about the job uh, when I first walked into the building. And uh, and I'm sure that those expectations have been far exceeded by actually living it for the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, how were you first involved with the board, Chairman? I would say my first involvement with the board would be um, when I was, uh, gosh, I would say that when I was flying corporate, uh, flying business aviation, uh. I uh, had a layover up here in Washington, and I jumped on the metro, uh, came down here. The NTSB oh. was at a, at a different location then. I just popped mm -hmm. in and uh, and uh, wandered around the NTSB and talked to people. Uh -huh. So that, that would have been <laughs> around 1979. But wow. uh, af after that, I um, in, in 1991, I interviewed Dr. John Lauber. I've got that article somewhere around here. Interviewed him um he was one of the board. He was a board member for ten years, and uh, and then going through the aircraft accident investigation school. So uh, I've had, uh, gosh, uh, many uh, decades of uh, in, in some form or fashion interacting with the NTSB. Wow, I mean, you know, you you mentioned earlier, uh, even back in college, you knew you wanted to be a board member, uh, and then when you're working in corporate, you were then again in in touch with the board, uh, interacting with the board. Um, what would you say um, uh, were some of the earlier milestones in in this uh, in this 20, 25 year journey? Um, you know, high school was one for flying and you had college uh, knowing you wanted to be part of the board. What's 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 uh, what's beyond that now? Yeah, as far as milestones getting here, I'd say a big one was. Uh was having a friend of mine come up to me and say, hey, you've always had this dream of wanting to be on the NTSB. Now you've got to go for it. Uh, that was the beginning of it. Exactly uh, um, exactly one year to the date later was my last day running a business aviation flight department. It was on Friday, uh, the 18th of, of, of August. Of, uh, that was my last day at the NTSB because the very next day I jumped in my car and drove to Washington uh, to be sworn in as an NTSB board member. So uh, I think uh, wow. the big milestone was, was making the decision to go for it, which was a year in the in the makings. And then, uh, of course, getting the call from the White House to say that, uh, that the president has decided to move forward with my nomination. Uh. Yeah, and uh, there have been a, a lot of a uh, lot of milestones along the way. But those, were, of course, were, were pretty significant ones. Right. You mentioned um, uh, it, there were friends uh, or peers, colleagues that, that really pushed you to, to uh, take that next step. Um, can you tell us about some of the mentors you had along the way? Yeah, I've had a lot of wonderful people along the way that have supported me, uh, sometimes uh, gave me some counsel to uh, help me be a better person. One would be Captain Bill Weeks. Bill, uh, Bill and I flew 
we never actually flew together because we were both captains, but we were simulator partners uh, for six weeks in Holland back in the early uh, 80s when we were uh, getting type rated in the Fokker F-28. We were part of the initial Piedmont Airlines uh, F-28 program. Uh, Bill would certainly be a, a mentor to me uh, in that he did. He is the one that encouraged me to go for the NTSB. But, um, you know, at the board itself, uh, Dr. John Lauber was a uh, was a mentor to me. I mean, he left in 1995, January of 95 is when he left. Uh, but still having interviewed him uh, for an article a few years earlier really helped me to understand how a board member should uh, do his or her job. So uh, I consider John Lawler to be a, a mentor of mine. But there have been so many people along the way that have really wow. helped me. Um, obviously, you know, we, we can learn, always learn lessons from uh, every accident that, that we encounter. Um, were there specific accidents during your time as a board member that, that uh, um, were particularly significant in your memory in terms of lessons learned? Yeah, and I want to preface that by saying that every accident that the board investigates obviously is, is significant. Any loss of life is significant. But there, there are several that really stand out in my mind um, for various reasons. For example, uh, the very first crash that I went to, I'd been on the job for seven days. That was the crash of Comair 5191 in Lexington, Kentucky. I had just been here. I had just been sworn in. And so, I mean, going to your first major aircraft accident with significant loss of life, that will always stick with you. Um, another one that uh, that really stands out for a different reason would be a, a train, literally a train wreck. It was the Amtrak uh, 188 that derailed in Philadelphia in 2015. It uh, The engineer got distracted, lost positional awareness, and attempted to go around a curve at 106 miles per hour when the maximum speed was 50 miles an hour. So you can see that laws of physics on that was not going to work out too well. In fact, the air, the, uh, the train did uh, hurdle off the tracks. There were eight fatalities and, and over 100 serious injuries. Mm -hmm. That one stood out to me simply because of the media presence. I've never seen an event with so much media presence. Um, and, and that one really stood out to me. Another one would be going to a, a balloon, a hot air balloon crash where there were 16 people in the balloon that, that all perished when it hit power, power lines and crashed to the ground. You know, I didn't even know that 16 people could fit into a hot air balloon. So there were several all together. I went on scene to 36 uh, accident sites. I was board member on scene for all but one of those. The Comair accident was what we call our hmm. training accident where I accompanied the company, Debbie Herzman. She was the board member on scene. And that's where you go and watch one, watch and see how it's done so that the next time you'll be the board member right. on scene. Um, I deliberated over 250 uh, accidents in the last 15 years. Wow, 250 accidents. Um, how do you think each of these accidents have uh, shaped you as a board member and have you grow as a board member? Well, I think as a person, uh, one thing that I'm constantly reminded of is just how precious life really is. I mean, people out um, just going for a, a Saturday, Saturday morning ride in a hot air balloon to celebrate anniversaries and birthdays and, and a belated Mother's Day and things like that, uh, never knowing how things are going to end. Uh, another big accident that I went to was a limousine crash up in upstate New York where 20 people lost their lives. And these are people that are just out on a, on a Saturday uh, going to various uh, uh, celebrating a birthday, renting a limousine so that they can uh, go to various um, breweries and have a good, 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 good Saturday afternoon. Uh, so I think really just how, how precious life is. And I try to, Always keep that in mind whenever my wife or daughter get on the road 
make sure that I tell them I love you and uh, please be careful. Right. Absolutely. How do you think the NTSB in general has uh, shaped or evolved uh, over the last 15 years, um, uh, comparing now to when you first joined? I mean, in terms of people, in terms of um, uh, practices and, and, and policies and things like that. Yeah, we're really, I, I brought the, well, I'm not, yeah, I, I hate to say I did it, but I did notice that we, that we, we would, when there was a crash or, or an accident, we would hold up a, a, an SOP manual for that company and say, you know, this company did not even follow their own SOPs. But yet when we looked in the mirror, I noticed that the NTSB didn't always follow our SOPs, or maybe we didn't necessarily have SOPs, or maybe we had them and they were scattered out into 2000 ops bulletins or something like that. So we've really tried to pull all of that together and have a have an, a, an accident investigation manual. We, we've tried to do that. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we're actually living that. I think we need to hold ourselves ourselves to the, to the same standard that we'd, we would hold somebody uh, that we were investigating uh, mm -hmm. to that, you know, we, we, so practice what we preach. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that we're, we're doing. We're really trying to live our values as an agency. Uh, so, you know, it's an agency that, that wants to continuously or constant improvement. And we're looking for, for ways to, to be better uh, every day. You know, this, um, I, when I interned uh, more than 10 years ago, there used to be, uh, I heard from one of the investigators, uh, the motto, or the personal motto, so to speak, um, uh, at the NTSB is really try to run uh, itself out of business, right? I mean, it, it's, it was a way of saying, hey, you know, enough's enough with, with accidents, with the loss of life. You know, every day, um, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, uh, draw lessons uh, from, from tragedy. Let's talk about technology. I mean, I've, you know, the, the level of technology in, in cockpits and, and in the cabins have, have uh, uh, upgraded itself over time, um, over the last 15 years, certainly. How uh, do the investigators adapt to that and maintain uh, awareness and, uh, let's say, proficiency with that as well? Yeah. So technology, um, I would say, has, has certainly helped our investigations uh, in so many ways. And it could be very basic technology such as our, our iPhones, our cellular phones, uh, because those devices were never intended to be used for accident investigation purposes. But there's a couple of ways that we really can get very good information from it. First would be very basic in that pictures People take pictures, and uh, if we can retrieve those pictures, they can help a lot to figure it, to help us understand the conditions that surrounded that tragedy. For example, in the balloon crash that I mentioned, we had pictures. People are out for a good time. They're taking pictures, and, and they were. T we could see photographs that they were posting on, uh, sending to their loved ones, and in those photographs, we could see that there was cloud mm. cover below the mm, balloon right and uh, so that was a that was a, a giveaway right there of, of what was going on but also uh, as you know inside of these little devices are lots of chips and those chips can give us a lot of information so we've we've set up um, it's almost like a cottage industry we've added to our lab, the, uh, a chip lab where our investigators can go in and try and extract information from from phones, from iPads, uh, from GPS units, uh, all types of um, electronic devices uh, now are very helpful in our accident reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Um, Chairman, I'm sitting here in Hong Kong. Obviously, you're in D.C. Um, let's talk about some of the international trips that you have had um, that may have made an impression on you or that may have broadened your understanding of, of uh, the international air safety community. Uh, what comes to mind when I say uh, NTSB and your involvement internationally? Well, let's talk about some international travel. I met a young man in, single, in, not, in Shanghai a few years ago that was uh, writing for this publication. <laughs> and uh, 
and here's your picture there. You were a, a senior editor for this magazine, and what you wrote about is the time that you, the, the, in 2010, when you interned for the NTSB, and you wrote a wonderful <laughs> article yes, about sir. that, and you Thank gave you. me this you gave me this publication, so uh, yeah. you know I, I, I think you still that, have it. <laughs> well, um, you know I keep I keep good stuff, that's for sure. But but you know that's where I met you was at a Bombardier right. safety stand down right. in Shanghai. Right. And what was that, Anthony? Was that 2013, maybe? That was 2013, I think so. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so you know you meet a lot of wonderful people along the way. But it's not about me. It's about the agency. And the agency does a lot of international investigations. As you know, when there's a foreign investigation, uh, if, if, the, if the crash, and we're talking airplanes at this point, if the accident involves a U.S. manufactured or designed product, U.S. registered, U.S. operated, um, the state of occurrence, wherever the accident occurs, uh, if they're a, 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 a signatory to annex the, uh, to the ICAO convention, uh, we're going to be invited in. There are 193 states, countries that are signatories to the uh, annex uh, to the uh, to the convention, and so that's mm -hmm. most of the countries in this world. So if there's a if there's a crash in some foreign country involving a U.S. manufactured or designed or operated uh, product NTSB will be invited to be an accredited representative to that investigation. Mm -hmm. Aviation is already um, a, such a small community, uh, and air safety is even smaller. I remember at that event at uh, Bombardier Safety Stand Down 2013. I've met, um, I believe, he was the chief uh, accident investigator for Airbus uh, before, um, and uh, he had. Uh, shared with me that he'd, he's worked with a couple of guys at the NTSB. And I just remember um, uh, he said Frank Hildrip of the NTSB and also Bill English. Uh, and that's when I realized, wow, you know, this this is an extremely small community, a tight knit community uh, with with the same uh, values and the same core mission. Indeed, as you pointed out, aviation, small community, accident investigation is even smaller. <laughs> Chairman, how do you think, um, let's um, over the last let's say year and a half, uh, where travel has been restricted, how do you think virtual platforms have helped enhance um, uh, your outreach uh, to the international community? Well, certainly uh, the ability to conduct virtual meetings uh, works very well, but I still think that you cannot beat the in-person meetings. So uh, it looks like air travel is back up. Uh, it will continue to grow. I see that uh, Delta Airlines has just said they they plan to hire a thousand pilots between now and next summer. So uh, things are starting to to boom again, and we hope that that pace can continue. But meanwhile, uh, through the COVID, we did learn that we can still function uh, pretty darn well in a virtual environment through through these uh, virtual platforms, Zoom and Teams and other. Um, other platforms, WebEx. Mm -hmm. uh, Chairman, uh, through uh, this industry and, and this uh, air safety community, we meet people from all walks of life, obviously. Um, and uh, just, just the other day, uh, I was looking at the all the biographies again uh, of the current board members and noticed uh, that, uh, that there what seems to be quite a diverse range of, of skill sets, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, member Chapman uh, had a music major uh, in for his bachelor's, uh, and I recall uh, Vice Chairman Landsberg uh, was a magazine editor himself for uh, for an aviation magazine. Um, how do you think uh, board members or investigators or NTSB staff in general uh, uh, might benefit from having a, a wide range or diverse range of skill sets uh, in terms of uh, helping with uh, uh, the agency's mission. Yeah, well, um, certainly uh, one of our core values is, in fact, diversity and inclusion. And uh, and 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 I will admit, uh, I will say that yes, Tom Chapman um, 
was a music major, but he went to law school after that and uh, worked for AOPA for uh, for uh, several years, and then Southwest Airlines, then U.S. Air or U.S. Airways, and uh, and then he worked on Capitol Hill for a number of years on the Senate Commerce. Uh, Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee uh, drafting legislation. Uh, Bruce Landsberg, yes, he was a uh, an editor for for a magazine, uh, but he worked for Flight Safety International, and then uh, AOPA was the executive director of the AOPA Air Safety Institute uh, for for years. So I wanted to to make sure that we we showed what their real qualifications uh, were. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is the value of diversity and inclusion. Uh, everybody can, can make a contribution, a significant contribution to the process. If we had all lawyers, if we had all human factors people, if we had all pilots, uh, we would see things a certain way. And by bringing in a diverse range of, of people, um, I think I know you get a better product. I also want to point out, I suspect most of the viewers understand this, but the, the NTSB is an agency of 400 people. Uh, most of those are investigative staff in the various modes, be it uh, aviation or highway or marine, or rail pipeline and hazardous materials. Most are investigative staff. The board consists of members. The investigators are the ones that investigate. Board members are not investigators. We go out on scene to be the face of the, the public face of the investigation um, to do the press release, uh, press uh, briefings and to meet with the with the family members, to, to meet with the elected officials. But we don't, we're not there to investigate. We, we leave that to the professionals and once they're completed with the investigation, they elevate the product to the board so that we can deliberate. Um, and I think it's important that um, and interesting that the the viewers um, understand that. So um, so by the time it comes to the board, uh, the technical work has been done. Now then the board gets a chance to uh, to to look at it, review it, to make comments on it. And I think by having that independent voice at the very end of the process allows us to see things, gaps in logic. Um, uh, you know, they're so close to the product that sometimes they may they know exactly what happened so there might be gaps in the logic of the report so we can we can come in and provide that oversight of the staff's products uh toward the end of that uh investigation for the viewers who might not be uh, familiar with the ntsb's uh um responsibilities um obviously uh the agency investigates uh different modes of transport um can you tell us more about those and more specifically how do uh the different departments um, complement each other in terms of um, uh, skills and practices, um, patterns, lessons learned, things like that. Yeah, we have a, a statutory requirement to investigate all civil aviation accidents in this country. So we do that. Uh, and there are about 12 or 1300 uh, each year in the, uh, in, in the U.S., ranging from um, uh, a Cessna 172, the pilot runs out of fuel, uh, tries to land a dead stick into a uh, field, and at, the, and, and at the very end, catches a wingtip, meets our definition of an accident due to substantial, because it's substantial damage, all the way up to a fatal airline crash and everything in between. Fortunately, we see most of the crashes we deal with, accidents we deal with, are on that lower end of the spectrum. But unfortunately, we certainly see our, our share of the uh, uh, of, of the accidents, most of which are general aviation. Mm. Uh, we get pinged on our phones a couple of times a day about some crash that happened somewhere that might have killed one or two or three people, unfortunately. Mm. So that's the aviation arena. Mm. In the rest of the modes, whether it's rail, pipeline, or hazardous materials, marine, um, highway, we have a lot of discretion in determining which of those we will go to. But on the aviation side, we investigate all civil aviation accidents that occur in this country. You know, it should not be much of a surprise at all that we see many of the same issues in accidents across each of the modes that we investigate. Uh, most involve um, human error. Many have 
organizational issues, uh, say, a lack of a safety culture, uh, lack of procedural compliance. Uh, so that should not surprise uh, many. So it is amazing the similarities uh, in the basic types of errors across the modes. Um, and th that's not the same for, let's say, uh, uh, highway or marine. Is that right? It's, it's more on a case-by-case -case basis. That's right. We look at the at, at the initial information coming out of that and decide, is this something where we feel that we we can we can really investigate and look for that incremental safety improvements that we're all interested in. Just a few days ago, there was a, uh, a fatal highway crash in Alabama. Uh, it claimed 10 lives. Uh, we're going to go to something like that just because of the massive loss of life. Um, can you give us some historical context of uh, the NTSB's most wanted list, um, how it came about and how it's evolved over time? Yeah, we uh, started that list. And of course, I was not part of the board at the time. It, uh, it began in 1990. It was an annual list. And then uh, in around 2016, we made the decision that it should come out uh, every other year so that we can really, really focus on those issues, put the spotlight on it. Uh, it used to be when I first came here, we would have, we might have 20 or 23 items on the most wanted list. And how do you effectively advocate for 20 or 23 items? So we, in 2016, when we made the change, we said, we're only going to look at uh, a maximum, no less than 10 and um, no more than 10 and uh, no less than five. And it's really those issues where we feel that might be ripe for action, things that if we keep pushing, 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 we can push them over the edge to where they get uh, they get completed. Are you satisfied with the, the progress of the list thus far? Well, I think any progress is good news. Sometimes things move slower than, uh, than we'd like for mm -hmm. them to. But ultimately, uh, a lot of what we push for actually gets done. So I've got uh, about uh, 20 photos here, and I'll start with what I think is uh, your youngest one. <laughs> Tell me about this one. Bring me back. Yeah, that was in uh, that was my first first full month on the line at uh, at Piedmont Airlines. It was May of uh, 1981. Captain Ed Thurber took that picture, and uh, that I had a full full block of time, full schedule. I had. Uh, more hair in a lot of different places then. <laughs> but I was, I was a flight engineer for about uh, about ten months on the seven twenty seven, and then I moved to the to the right seat of the seven twenty seven. Things were happening very fast at the airline then, and uh, so I had a wonderful career with the airline. Right. I think this picture here was uh, probably around nineteen eighty six. Uh, certainly, I don't even recognize either of those two. Uh, but the young young boy is a is a young lad that lived across the street from us. Uh, he just had his fortieth birthday uh, uh, three weeks ago. So that that ought to give you an idea that that picture was right. long long ago. I was, I was flying a, a football charter. The, the family had moved to uh, to the Raleigh Durham area. I was flying a football charter uh. and. Uh, I forget, I forget which team it was, but they met me out at the airport. And uh, back in those days, you could, uh, you know, things were a little looser with security. So we got uh, we got him uh, to sit right there and take a picture of me. But, uh, yeah, that was a while ago. I mean, the 737 doesn't, uh, the inside of the 737 doesn't look a lot like that. <laughs> no, days. sure, they don't. <laughs> Steam gauges all the way. What about this one right here? And I think that one was on the same trip. Uh, one day. Yeah. Then I moved over to business aviation for a few years to run a, um, um, a corporate flight department for a Fortune 500 company. And uh, I did that. And uh, and that's when my friend came up to me and said, hey, you've always wanted to be on the NTSB. Now you've got to go mm -hmm. for it. Do, do you still uh, keep in touch with some of the folks that you've met along the way in, in these airlines and in, in let's say, Scanna? Yeah. I do. I got a text from one of the former scanner scanner pilots just mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, and so I do. I do keep in touch with them. I've met wonderful people, worked with wonderful people along the way. How about this one right here? So that's a shot of your scanner days. That's right. Um, scanner had two King Airs, and uh, and uh, I, I was the manager of aviation, 
we had just taken delivery of that airplane that day, that day. and uh, so we got it got it home, and uh, I decided to get a picture of it. Right. How do you think your Scanna days and your experience uh, gained from uh, uh, your Scanna experience uh, uh, benefited you as uh, as as a uh, um, part of the agency work that you did? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, before I went to Scana, and Scana was a Fortune 500 company in South Carolina, they've since, uh, they're an energy company. A few years ago, they were taken over by Dominion Energy. Um, and so uh, before those days running the uh, business aviation flight department, I, uh, I'd never really managed people. So I think being at Scana helped me to to develop those skills. Mm. Never had done performance reviews because I'd been a, an airline pilot uh, mm. and I didn't have those responsibilities. So it, it helped me to understand things like um, um, strategic planning, um, budgeting. Uh, so it really did help me to come here, mm. I think. I so see. Never knew that one day I would have a, Hundred and eighteen point four million dollar budget <laughs> right. to uh, to be responsible for. Right. Uh, can you tell me more about this photo right here, uh, Chairman? Yeah, the thing that really strikes me is the fact that I could button that coat <laughs> back in those days, and uh, and so that's the one thing that really uh, gets my attention. Um, I did put that coat on a few weeks ago just to prove a point, <laughs> and uh, and it doesn't uh, doesn't fit as well. <laughs> Uh, that was the day I was sworn in um, initially as a board member. Chairman, then Chairman Mark Rosenker, uh, swore me in, and now I'm the one that gives the oath of office to NTSB employees. Mm -hmm. There's a a cycle of life, so to speak. Indeed. How about uh, some of these uh, media shots? This is a little more recent. Obviously, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, all of these. These events that we deal with are tragic. Uh, this was the first passenger fatality on board a U.S. scheduled mm. carrier uh, since the Colgan Air crash, right. which was in 19 or 2000, uh, 2009. The event we're looking at here, of course, was the Southwest event that had a uh, uh, an engine failure, shrapnel from the from the fan cowling banged against the fuselage, punctured a window, and unfortunately a a 41-year-old woman was partially ejected and lost her life. So we we uh, we got up there that afternoon to Philadelphia and uh, flew in the Gulf Stream to get up there, the FAA's Gulf Stream. Uh, immediately upon having our experts look in look in there, they immediately said, "This is this is metal fatigue. We see the classic." Uh, signs of metal fatigue, and that evening at an 8 p.m. press briefing, uh, we could report accurately that uh, this was a uh, fan blade separation was because of metal mm -hmm. fatigue. Since Colgan, you said, huh? That was... Uh... Yeah. Now, there had been some, and I don't want to diminish mm -hmm. it, there had been some cargo uh, pilot fatalities, Um uh, in, during, during that nine-year period, uh, and of course, Asiano right. had a uh, had a three fatalities here in in San Francisco in 2013, right. but those were not on board a U.S. scheduled carrier. So I, again, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not trying to parse words and indicate that those crashes, those fatalities, were not significant. But I am trying to make the point that the U.S. scheduled major airlines. Have had a very good safety record uh, over the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. I can't help but remember. Uh, I think the first the first time I've been uh, inside the boardroom was uh, for the Colgan uh, board meeting. Uh, I remember it was I think it was over seven hours uh, back to back. Um, Yeah, that meeting started at 9.30 in the morning, and we ended, as I recall, about 7.15 in the evening. Right. Uh, it was a long board meeting, but ultimately we got done what needed to be done, and that was um, determine the probable cause and issue safety recommendations that would improve airline safety. And most of those recommendations have now been 
uh, folded into legislation, and uh, and those things have been act enacted upon. So, uh, as tragic as that crash was, uh, as you know, we have at the training center, and you have a picture of it. The plaque says, "From tragedy, we draw knowledge to improve the safety for us all," and and that is what that crash did. Uh, is that it took something very very tragic, but fortunately. Um, many good things happen to improve airline safety as a result of that. Tragedy. Yes, sir. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, let's see. So talk about boardrooms and board meetings. Tell me about this, this shot right here. You know, I don't remember exactly which board meeting that was, but uh, it's, it's when we're in a non COVID situation uh, about every, at least once a month, the board would gather uh, to deliberate, uh, a particular accident or series of accidents uh, that staff has elevated up to up to the board. And we uh, all of our board meetings are done um, in the open, transparently, and even in the COVID situation, um, we will have on June the 29th, we will have our 13th virtual board meeting that we've had since the COVID situation. Mm. So uh, we've managed to just pick up and keep going uh, in the virtual environment, uh, and all of our board meetings are webcast. So, uh, but this is this is what those what our boardroom right. looks like. Hey, tell me about this one. This was a UPS uh, an A three hundred dash six hundred that crashed in Birmingham, Alabama, on approach. It was a nighttime approach, early hours of the morning, uh, and they were the weather was not wonderful. Uh, they were conducting a, a a non-precision approach uh, to runway 18 and uh, unfortunately uh, blew through the minimum descent altitude and uh, it was really a, a classic control flight into terrain accident. So here's Joe Cedor, who is the head of our major accident investigation division, mm -hmm. uh, pointing out to me some of the things about the about the crash site. Mm -hmm. um Chairman, may I ask how um, does the agency select uh, which board member to launch to which accident? Yeah, it's simply luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. Each board member serves a week on the board on the go team. The go team runs from from five o'clock on Monday afternoon to five o'clock the following Monday, mm -hmm. and uh, there's. There's a selected uh, staff on the go team, uh, depending on the mode, and uh, those people are, are ready to go. And then a board member is a part of 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 that of that rotation. And so I had a, a situation where I was, uh, um, I think I launched on six accidents in seven months, wow. and. Uh, yeah, very busy, but then I've gone two and a half years without going to anything. The last uh, accident that I went to was the Atlas air crash mm. uh, in uh, down by Houston mm. back in February of 2019. Right, so it can be sort of a uh, feast or famine type of uh, launch situation. Um, how about this one right here, Chairman? Yeah, so that would be one of the many media events that we had in the uh, uh, Amtrak crash at Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even know how many, whether it was a, a stand-up media event like this, a press briefing, if you will, or if it was a one-on-one. -on -one. I had uh, a couple of days where I was out there from 6 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night uh, doing... Uh, press briefings, one-on-ones uh, -on, -on, on national TV or local TV or whatever it was. It was just a, a, a culmination of things. It, the train was going from Washington, D.C. to New York. Uh, again, there were eight fatalities. Uh, it happened in Philadelphia. So you've got the media market from Washington, where the train left, New York, where the train was mm -hmm. going, and then in a major market in Philadelphia. So all, the confluence of all of that uh, resulted in very quickly a national media story. Mm -hmm. When you're on a, when you're on scene um, in an accident like this, in a major, you know, high visibility accident like this, uh, what's your top priority or what are your top priorities? Uh, 
Well, my function as a board member on scene is not to be the investigator and to allow the investigator to do his or her job. And I say investigator, that's plural. But my, my three functions are be the spokesperson for the agency to one of our values is transparency. We want to release factual information and underline factual. We want to release factual information as we learn it. On the very first press briefing that we did, that uh, the evening, the accident happened about nine o'clock. It happened uh, about nine o'clock at night. And um, and so we, we were on scene the very next morning. That, that evening, we were able to already report that the train speed was 106 miles per hour. Um, and so we release uh, factual information as we learn. We can uh, move on to the next photo here. You mentioned uh, an FAA plane. I wasn't sure if it was this one. Yeah, you're right. That's when we are getting on the plane to fly up to Philadelphia for the Southwest Airlines uh, event. Yeah. I see you've got uh, some notes there, perhaps uh, some briefing notes. The FAA uh, uh, will provide lift for us if, if a plane is available, and they always prepare a little briefing sheet to mm. tell us who, uh, who the pilots are and what the flight time is. And, I uh, see. And then I always always want to have a bottle of water uh, close by. What's your usual uh, um go time in terms of from from notification to uh let's say being on the plane what's that that window of time that, that you have to make that happen there's a rumor that we want the go team launched in two hours uh, <laughs> that's not that's not exactly correct but we do try to get there as quickly and as safely as we can as it as it turns out the southwest event happened uh, in the morning uh, we were able to scramble pretty quickly and get up there. I think we got up there around four in the afternoon and did, did our first press conference at, at eight that evening. Uh, there are other accidents like the uh, the Amtrak crash that happened at nine o'clock at night. And uh, getting up there at, at midnight wasn't really going to accomplish anything. Uh, so we we did try to get some sleep and then... Um, and then get in there the next morning uh, because we are not the first responders. We don't have to slide down a pole and jump on the back of a fire truck and get there in, in you know, 20 seconds. Uh, we want to we want to let the first responders do their jobs uh, before we can get in and, and do ours. So it really depends on the on the situation as to how quickly we uh, we end up getting there. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, I mean, go team does uh, trans, uh, transport themselves to the accident sites uh, via via ground, ground, ground transport. It's, it's not always that you guys take the FAA jet. Is that correct? You're exactly right. I mean, we can get there a number of ways. We, we literally walked to an investigation once. We, mm. As you know, our headquarters are in Long Hall Plaza in Washington, D.C. Right. There happens to be a subway station in the basement of our building. Right. And uh, there was a subway a smoke event that unfortunately a lady perished because of. Uh, and so our investigators were literally able to catch the elevator down and, and walk to that, to that event. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, sometimes we'll go via an FAA jet. We have, um, we will commercial airline uh, on many, many occasions. And, um, and for the, uh, for at least two events in, in uh, Philadelphia, we have uh, driven. Uh, we've driven to events in New York, uh, mm -hmm. New York City. So it just depends uh, the, the, the the availability of lift by the FAA and uh, and and how we can get there. Mm -hmm. There's kind of an oldie here. We can. Uh, can you talk about this one? Yeah, I did end my airline career on uh, on the Airbus A320. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in 2002, and uh, just uh, just a, a, a stopover in Pittsburgh, as I recall, before we headed home for our last leg, uh, Pittsburgh to Charlotte. So uh, mm -hmm. again, I'm starting not to recognize the uh, individual <laughs> in the picture, uh, but uh, but somebody said that I used to look like that. Yeah, I can see the uh, the uh, at least the cockpit tech have uh, improved uh, substantially here. Here's you in Shanghai. 
Ah. There you go. Here's the here's the two of us. I think this was the last time wow. uh, we had physically met, uh, 2013. Uh, and I was surprised to see the NTSB there. I, I had not known at the time, I think, that that you guys uh, traveled internationally uh, for certain events. Uh, so I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, yeah. You know, the Bombardier folks um, have done an excellent job uh, for – I think 25 years now with safety stand down and they invited me uh, on to be a speaker at, at the event in Wichita. And then there were two occasions for the international ones uh, where they didn't want me to go along. And, um, you know, they, so people might say, why are the tax dollars paying for Robert Sumwalt to go to Shanghai? Um, in fact, um, there are certain cases where, I, I can accept the gift of travel. And in both of those cases, one in, to, to Brazil and one to Shanghai, the, I can accept on behalf of the agency a gift of travel. And so the taxpayers did not uh, uh, pay my expenses to go there. Bombardier did. And we, of course, have to disclose that and report it to uh, to the ethics uh, folks. And I all. see. So it's all about the board. But, uh, I, I'm very happy to hear that. I'm glad that... Uh we can make that clear uh, for our viewers. And I see one that's similar. I see also a Lombardi one here. What's this one uh, about? Our good friend Jim Schultz is, um, is on the left side of the picture. Jim uh, um, is, a, uh, is like a brother to me. He flew F-4s, uh, Phantoms, uh, in the Air Force, and then, uh, and then went in actually in the railroad business and uh, – was very very involved with the Federal Railroad Administration. Was their uh, was their chief safety officer and and uh, and uh, had been a deputy administrator, and then became vice president for uh, for one of the major railroads. Jim um, recommended me or, or nominated me to receive the Bombardier Safety Stand Down Award, and he did did such a beautiful job writing the nomination uh, that I did receive it in 2015 and uh it was quite an event and uh the trophy is sitting right here uh, across my office right. and the trick is going to be to figure out how to get that south carolina without without breaking it <laughs> better make sure that's packed uh <laughs> it's armored gotta make sure it's armored <laughs> yeah in fact the first one that arrived the big one uh the, when it arrived it was actually broken uh, so Bombardier uh, uh, got it fa right. fixed and it's very very, very fragile so Wonderful. we'll have to take good care yes, of it. Sure. How did you first meet um, Jim Schultz here? I met Jim Schultz through uh, Professor Naj Mashkati uh, at the University of Southern, Southern California. Um, Metrolink uh, was Metrolink being the commuter rail out in, uh, out in uh, the, the LA basin uh, was putting on a safety sym symposium, and Dr. Mishkati had uh, had recommended uh, that I I be a part of that forum, and that's where I met Jim Schultz, and we quickly bonded because we really are like-minded. We both uh, truly believe in safety. Jim co-authored a book on called "Leading People Safely," and another one called "Bad Company, Good Company," where um, you know he's written a couple of good books that. That, that I really subscribe to to his views on leadership. He's just a, a, a great soul. Right, right. Wonderful to hear. Uh, we've got one um, that is also in the flight deck. How about this one? This one looks substantially upgraded. Yeah, yeah that uh, was in the Boeing 787 simulator uh, a number of years ago. I think that was 2012. And uh, they stuck me in the sim just to see... see uh, see if I could fly it. And, uh, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun to get back and get my hands on a, on a stick and throttle again. Right. Have you gotten a chance, um, let's say over the last 15 years to, to continue flying at all, uh, whether it was for, for, for training or for pleasure or anything like that? I really have not, Anthony. Um, I figure if I can't do it the way that I think it, it would be best done, I don't. I don't want to do it. When I was flying for the airline or for Scana, I was proficient hmm. in and out of the simulator every six months, flying a well-maintained aircraft, and uh, 
And, and I feel like if I can't do it the way that I would want to do it, I, I don't want to do it. And uh, I've, I've forgotten a whole lot about, uh, about uh, hmm. things. Uh, how, how, how exactly do you want to do that? It, it, the flying? Well, I want to be up to speed on, on everything that I need to know. And it's one of those things that if you don't constantly stay in the books, uh, you're, you're going to forget it. And uh, I mm. felt like when I was doing it, I was in the books uh, all the time, uh, mm. studying for a check ride every six months and things like that. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, really, mm -hmm. my, I've not been using that part of my brain uh, mm -hmm. for the last some would argue for my entire life, but uh, but I, I really have <laughs> not uh, been, been thinking about the regulations and uh, and right. uh, class B airspace and and all you know all of those yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, all the far aims. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you miss flying, Chairman? Well, well of course, of course. Uh, today mm -hmm. is a beautiful day in Washington, and and I'd love to strap on an airplane and, and do something, but mm -hmm. frankly. Um, I've been so immersed in the job here uh, that mm -hmm. I don't um, I, I don't think about how much I miss flying too often. Uh, you know, every time a plane f flies over, naturally I'm going to look at it. My mm -hmm. office faces uh, faces the Washington National Reagan Airport, and uh, and so I love to watch the airplanes take off and land. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think flying will always be a part of me, uh, but I'm not always a part of it any longer. Mm -hmm. oh, that's well said. We have one here uh, that is uh, of you in inside yeah. a boardroom. Yep. Yeah, and it looks like uh, perhaps uh, a congressional hearing of sorts. Is that right? Yeah, I ended up testifying to Congress on 17 occasions. And in 2019, mm -hmm. I think I testified to Congress six times uh, in one year. Wow. Wow. Ooh is were regarding the 737 max and mm -hmm. this was this was uh the first testimony that we did on the 737 max i think it was march the 26th as you know the the last the the second of the two 737 maxes was on march the 10th so this was just two weeks later and uh, obviously i am intent on making some sort of a point uh, in that picture right there right right I see one here that uh, may be similar, could even be on the same uh, occasion. Okay. And uh, so. let's see if it says, no, well, I was wrong. I was wrong by a day. March 27th. You're right. Okay. So, so that was uh, th th that was something that the NTSB created and put on our digital message right. board there. Right. Okay. Uh, here's one with the media. Yeah. I need the press. Yeah. So I mentioned... Uh, I mentioned the Amtrak accident in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, when we got back, uh, we did all five Sunday morning shows, and that's a very unusual event to do all five in one day. Uh, so this was obviously Meet the Press, mm -hmm. um, most of which were taped in advance that morning, uh, but they ran that morning. The only one that was done live was CBS Face the Nation. So that was a morning that mm. started out at six in the morning, and we were literally going from one studio to the next. And one one of the humorous things about that is that uh, we told the driver, and it was a different driver for each network, mm -hmm. and I don't know how that all worked, but they were told to be in such and such place at such and such time. And the driver uh, asked us where we're going. We said CBS and they dropped us off at a CVS drugstore. Oh, oh, goodness. And, 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 yeah. uh, and fortunately, it was just uh, a few doorsteps away from the CBS studio. That yeah. one was, was a critical time because we had to be there on time because that was going to be uh, live the, on air, on, live on the air. But we, we kind of yeah. laughed about that, that we <laughs> old driver CVS, CVS, and he takes us to CVS. Right. <laughs> Let's see. Here's a fantastic one. This is in the same office, if I'm not mistaken. That, that would be exactly right. And uh, and uh, you can see the, yeah, as I mentioned, I had about 30 airplanes. 
The Falcon, oh, yeah, is, still, right. the Falcon is still there, uh, yeah. but uh, almost all the other ones were, were my personal airplanes. And uh, so, uh, so they have, they have gone to my wife's yeah. dismay home. Uh, this was a shot for a local South Carolina publication, you know, one of these uh, business publications. So I wanted to show my South Carolina roots there. And that, definitely. of course, is the South Carolina state flag and, and other things. Right. How about this one? This is one of my favorite photos of, uh, of you. Yeah. Tell me about this one. Yeah. This was a, this was, um, January of 2013. Yeah. Right before I met you, uh, this was a, a ferry boat in New York City called the Sea Street Wall Street that would run from New Jersey to literally Wall Street. And, uh, and it, uh, uh, due to some confusion in the operation of the vessel, the, 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 the captain of the vessel did not slow down, rammed into a dock. As you know, like when, when, a, when a train or tr vessel like this is about to arrive, people will get mm -hmm. up and, and you know, they, they want to disembark quickly. And some people were standing up, some at the top of the steps when the, when the vessel rammed into the into the dock with some speed, somebody toppled down the, the steps, and uh, nobody no no lives lost, but I think some of the injuries were, in fact, life altering. So we were doing a a press briefing um, at some point, and uh, so so uh, that's the story, yeah. but but behind yeah. that one. Well, Chairman, with. Uh with all that's been said and done, um, what advice do you have for the younger generation, uh, the next generation to come who are interested in aviation, particularly those who are interested in aviation safety? Well, I have a lot of faith in the, uh, in the next generations, plural. Uh, there are a lot of smart young people out there. Uh, they know technology like, certainly I don't understand. I understand that they're teaching coding and you know, very early grades. I have trouble even turning on my computer. Um, I have a lot of a lot of faith and confidence uh, in 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 the future. Um, my advice to anybody is the advice that my grandfather gave to me, and that is uh, follow your passion. If you if you do what you really love doing, as the old saying goes, you won't work a day in your life. I've had some days that uh, flying for the airline where. Uh, weren't exactly fun because we were dealing with uh, snowstorms or thunderstorms or something like that. But I do believe in following your passion. And uh, that would be the advice I would have for anybody. Well said, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what will you miss uh, the most about the agency? I'm deeply going to miss the NTSB. It's an agency that I've revered for decades. So I will miss the agency, but the agency is nothing without people. And we have wonderful, as you know, from interning here, Anthony, we have wonderful people here. Uh, some people think that government workers are just uh, uh, maybe lazy. There's nothing lazy about the people that work at the NTSB. Uh, they are very dedicated, they're bright, they love their work, and they truly are working to make a difference. So I will deeply miss the men and women of the NTSB. Yes, sir. Um, obviously, you are closing a chapter in your life um, uh, on the 30th of June. Uh, what are you looking forward to next? Well, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting back to South Carolina, taking some time off, a couple of months off. Uh, and and then, I, then I hope to be able to reflect and figure out what I want to do. Uh, when I grow up, assuming I ever do grow up. <laughs> well, Chairman Summel, I know I speak for many when I say um, I will personally miss you and your being on the board uh, with the agency. Um, thank you uh, for uh, the last 15 years uh, of tireless advocacy uh, for transportation safety. And uh, on behalf of AIN, I'd like to I uh, wish you a happy birthday as well. Happy early birthday. Uh, and I hope that is a safe and joyous occasion. 
Anthony, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to uh, to work with you over the past several months on some of the events you've put on uh, in, in uh, Asia. Keep up the great work. Be safe and be well. Thank you. And thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.